A world that's lost its way needs a healer, someone to patch up its wounds and tend to its pain. It needs a doctor. When day broke, the sun turned from a giver of life, the thing that wakes the rooster and makes the crops grow, to an indiscriminate killer, wiping out all organic life forms. The world seemed truly lost, but one anomalous being made it his goal to soothe the hurt, to make it safe to step into the light once more. The Plague Doctor had done his best with the limited resources afforded to him at the abandoned Foundation site. The scientists had left behind all of their equipment when the Red Sun came, when they all were transformed. He had appointed himself the site director, willing to take up the mantle when no one else would. He had assembled a brave, brilliant team of fellow anomalies. The verbose Dr. Spanko, the eloquent adventurous Lord Blackwood, and the charismatic but ravenous Ferdinand. There had, of course, been those who scoffed at his vision, who did not share his noble goal. The abominable, possessive mask taunted him persistently, trying its best to get under his chitinous skin. But he did not have time to waste on such trivial psychological games, and he ignored its taunts to focus on the work. It hadn't been easy. Capturing one of the infected specimens, the former human being turned mass of oozing gelatinous flesh by the unholy light in the sky. One had made its way into the abandoned facility, sliding its way across the floor with an air of confused malice. It wanted to hurt, but it didn't know where it was, who it was, anymore. But it was frightened, the play doctor could tell. A good physician always knows and can sense the fear and pain of a suffering person. It made his heart ache to see, and he knew there was only one thing to do. Try to make this poor soul well again. Everyone, please assist me in escorting the patient to my laboratory, the doctor called out. This was once a man, and I believe with our combined intellect and resources, we can return him to his former state. Ferdinand took a step toward the slimy creature, licking his lips a bit. Do you think I could have just a little bit of it? Oh, I'm so hungry, doctor, he begged. No, no, it would go against my oath as a physician to allow any more harm to come to this poor fellow. The plague doctor shook his head solemnly. Ferdinand pouted, but did not press the issue further. No. The doctor rubbed his gloved hands together in anticipation of the next task. It is imperative we contain our new friend safely, if you would, please. He gestured to several of his previous patients, now reanimated and ready to aid him with his research. The shuffling figure surrounded the blobby entity, ushering it down the hall. Confused, lost, with no real sense of a plan left in its mushy consciousness, the creature followed where it was led. The group made it back to the doctor's laboratory. Cut! shouted Dr. Spanko from his perch atop a nearby shelf. Yes, indeed, the doctor replied. A standard operating table wouldn't do for such a special patient. I have nowhere to place the restraints, you see. I will have to make do with the floor. Ferdinand, my bag, if you please. The giant rushed to his side, dropping the bag at his feet. If he dies, then can I eat it? He asked, shifting from one foot to the other like a child asking a parent for a second helping of ice cream. If I am unable to save the patient, which I do deem unlikely, then... Yes, you may help me dispose of the remains, the doctor relented, but I do not hope it comes to that. He pressed a hand to his beak in deep thought for a moment, before opening his bag and pulling out a syringe filled with clear liquid. To begin, we must sedate the patient. He had no way to find a vein, and so he plunged the needle into the nearest section of the creature's soft surface, injecting a dose of sedative. Then he waited. The oozing motion of the entity slowed and stopped. It lay there on the ground, a still mound of flesh, save for the occasional expanding and contracting motion, almost as if it was breathing. Excellent. Now there was no risk of the patient fleeing the operating room mid-procedure. He could truly begin. It was an arduous process that took hours of effort, of taking small tissue samples, attempting to make incisions only for the flesh to fuse back together seconds after the scalpel was taken away. This was truly an advanced illness, unlike anything he had ever seen before. It was enough to make him question his abilities as a doctor, but he shook the thought away. Self-pity never helped anyone. After about eight hours of continuous work, he had a breakthrough, a solution he had created long ago. 
A thick, green liquid sealed in a dusty jar had a miraculous effect when dripped onto one of the tissue samples. The melted flesh reconstituted, became solid and human again. Eureka! He cried out, unable to restrain the sudden joy that leaped into his heart. This could be it. Very carefully, he filled the dropper with the green liquid. If these initial trials had been successful, then perhaps he couldn't finish the thought. Best not to get ahead of himself. He crossed to his patient and slowly began to pour the solution over the creature's viscous surface. He watched as the flesh toughened, coming together into a surface resembling human skin. It was working. It was working. But then the creature began to quiver, shaking uncontrollably like a bowl of jelly in an earthquake. The surface rippled, and the doctor could hear a high-pitched whine filling the room. Then, with a wet pop, the patient exploded, sending chunks of flesh splattering all over the room, painting the walls and ceiling. The doctor cried out in shock and horror, and in spite of himself, fell to his knees in despair. He had been so close, but still, he had failed. And who could say when he would find another test subject? If he would ever find a cure, I'm afraid I do not know what to do now, the doctor admitted. Fernand sighed. The next several days passed in a haze. The doctor paced around his laboratory, mulling over his possible mistakes again and again. He had rushed the process, he was certain of that now. It was a novice mistake, the sort of thing he might have done a century or two ago. How could he have been so foolish? How could he have made that innocent pay the price for his own hubris? As the doctor locked himself away in his mind palace, Fernand occupied himself by practicing his favorite songs. Lord Blackwood rode on the massive man's shoulder as he sang through the opera Don Giovanni. I once saw a production of this at the Teatro La Fenice in Venice, Lord Blackwood interjected his rhinopores twitching in delight at the memory. Marvelous production, marvelous city. I was there hunting a rogue tattle worm, wrecking havoc through the canals. I nearly lost my life on that voyage. Would you all be quiet for once in your miserable lives? A voice hissed from the shadows. There in the doorway, its face fixed in a frown, was the possessive mask. Black slime dripped from its eye holes, spilling down onto the plastic mannequin body it had taken hold of. Listening to you both is worse than being locked in that infernal box. The mask looked around the room, searching for someone. Where is the good doctor? It asked, voice dripping with disdain. Still moping about, counting his failures. Ignore him, my fine fellow. Lord Blackwood whispered to Fernand. Only those with weak constitutions and no achievements of their own spend their days dragging others down. When you have lived as long as I, you will learn this. <laughs> Careful, my lord. I'll stop by the kitchen and find some salt to pour on you. If you wish to fight me, then challenge me to a fair duel like a man. The colorful slug bellowed. Drawn by the sudden shouting, the doctor walked into the room. What is all this commotion? Oh, good. The mask clapped its plastic hands together, its face warping back into an eerie smile. There you are. This has all been so dreadfully boring. I came to see the remnants of your greatest shame. Are there still bloodstains on the floor in your pathetic little laboratory? You are a villain, the doctor seethed. Uncomfortable with the air of conflict in the room, Fernand and Lord Blackwood quickly exited to find another space where they could sing and share stories in peace. I simply speak the truths no one wants to hear. The mask crossed to the doctor's side with a series of light, dance-like steps that made the mannequin body creak. In fact, I have quite a few truths to share today. I've been outside, you see. Whatever's become of the sun only affects organic beings, and so... He gestured from his ceramic face to his plastic body. I am quite safe from its rays. You've been... Outside, the doctor couldn't keep the curiosity out of his voice. He was a scientist after all. Why, yes. Would you like to know what I've seen? 
black slime dripped from the mask's mouth, pooling on the floor with a sizzling sound. I'm in no mood for tricks, the doctor warned. The mask held up his hands in mock surrender. No, no tricks, tricks, doctor. But if you'd rather take your chances outside and see for yourself, I can take my leave now. No, the doctor shook his head. Please, do tell me. It's so much worse than you could even imagine. The mask's words were bleak, but its tone was gleeful. Everywhere you look out there, the light has made monsters. Humans, dogs, cats, mice, the wild beasts of the forest, all melted down into creatures you would not even recognize. But that isn't all. No, that is not all. There are massive beasts, ten feet tall or more, made from dozens and dozens of the creatures coming together. They fuse and meld into one giant entity roving the streets in search of more and more bodies to add to the pile, an oozing, gaping maw of hunger and hate that seeks only to consume and destroy. It calls out to surviving humans in the voices of their fallen loved ones, tugs at their heartstrings to lure them out of their hiding places, and then it wraps around them with fleshy tentacles, pulling them in until they are no more. Just another part of the monster. Oh, Doctor, it's terror. It's an abomination. I could watch it all day. The Doctor wanted to believe the mask was lying, that it was trying to torment with him, with awful fabrications. But after all he had seen so far, he knew that its words were true. Get out of my sight, he said. Or what? The mask stared him down with its unmoving smile. I've seen what you do to your hosts, you know. Your body won't last forever, the doctor growled. Hmm, -mm. true. Maybe next I'll take yours. <laughs> the mask laughed a long, dark laugh of something ancient and evil. Then it turned and walked out the door, leaving the doctor alone. He spent so much of his time that way lately. His assistants were preoccupied. His former patients provided no real company, and so he did what he did best, carry on in solitude. He couldn't be sure how long he stood there in silence, thinking of what the mask told him. He knew it was dangerous outside, knew he was up against powerful destructive forces, but it was even worse than he had thought. What if the world was truly doomed? What if this was how it all ended? Not with a bang, but with a great melting. Suddenly, the doctor heard a sound he hadn't heard since the sun turned wrong. A scream. A human scream. Could it be? He had to see for himself. He grabbed his bag of tools and rushed down the hall, his robes fluttering behind him. There it was again. A different human voice, screaming in terror. As he grew closer to the sound, he could hear footsteps. Various other voices overlapping with each other. He rounded the corner, and there they were. A group of five humans, wrapped in tattered clothes, dirty and exhausted. Behind them was the entrance to what looked like a tunnel. Somehow they found a secret passage and made their way inside. Then he saw what made them scream. Clearly these people were afraid and unaccustomed to the sight of a man of Fernand's stature, especially when the man was drooling and staring at them with hunger in his eyes. He would have to defuse the situation quickly. Hello, welcome. We mean you no harm, strangers. He stepped between Fernand and the humans. A man at the front of the group brandished a firearm, pointing the barrel directly at the doctor's beak. Please, sir, there's no need for violence. What are you? The man stammered. The other members of his party cowered behind him. An ally, if you will permit me to be. I'm a physician, you see, working on a cure for the condition that plagues the world. With a shaking hand, the man slowly lowered his gun. He did not put it away, though. You've figured out a cure for those things? I am in the process of developing it. So far, I have not been successful, but perhaps with your help? How do we know we can trust you? The man demanded. How am I supposed to know you're not part of this? Do you know who this man is? Fernand bellowed. This is Dr. John Watson, and I am Detective Sherlock Holmes, the greatest investigator in the world. There isn't a case we can solve. 
The man looked at the woman next to him, and the two shared a wide-eyed glance. This, this guy's crazy, he whispered furtively. Put your weapon away, and we can speak more calmly, the doctor proposed. At this inopportune moment, a few of his revived patients shambled into view, and the man screamed again. This time he fired his weapon, shooting at one of the walking corpses. The bullets ricocheted off the walls and several of the patients were hit. Please stop! With no other option, the doctor grabbed the man's arm, hoping to get a hold of the weapon and end the potential bloodshed. As soon as his gloved hand made contact, the man went limp and dropped to the ground with a hard thud. The woman next to him pulled him into her arms, checking his pulse. He's dead! She shrieked, tears streaming down her face. I... I am so sorry, my lady. I did not intend... She grabbed the man's gun and trained it on the doctor once more. You killed him! She cried. The other survivors were too shaken to speak, to move. One of them had his back turned to the group and was staring into the darkness behind him. Whatever he was looking at, it was worse than the chaos unfolding. But no one noticed the beige flesh tentacle snaking along the ground until it was too late until it had grabbed a hold of the man's ankle and dragged him into the tunnel with a shriek of pure, unadulterated terror. The woman nearly dropped her gun at the sound, whirling around to see what had happened. Deep in the tunnel, the scream warped into a wet gurgling sound, and then there was silence for a long moment. But then, something worse, a gooey, slimy sound. The sound of something enormous, something soft and fleshy making its way through the tunnel and toward the group. Another tentacle curled around the edge of the opening, then another joined it. Something emerged that might have once been a hand, but it had melted into something unrecognizable. The monster emerged piece by piece until the doctor could see the entire thing. It looked like a heap of people, dozens of them clambering on top of each other, wrapping their limbs together until their flesh and insides emptied out and fused into a shapeless mass. It moved a bit like a giant slug, slimy and slow, but it seemed to know it could take its time. As the survivors scrambled back away from it, Ferdinand and the doctor taking a few steps back of their own, the sound of human voices filled the room. There were unintelligible whispers, the soft giggle of a child, a woman weeping. Come and be with us. A little boy's voice broke through the cacophony. Mommy, I miss you. Don't you miss me? The woman with the gun let out a broken sob. Billy? She sniffled. It's me, Mommy. The innocent voice continued, emanating from somewhere deep inside the monstrous mass that crept along the ground, swelling and grasping with its ropey tentacles. Come play with me outside. All you have to do is come outside. Madame, the creature is not who it claims to be. The doctor spoke up, and it seemed to shake the woman out of a trance. You're not my son, she hissed, squeezing the trigger and firing at the monster. The bullet made contact with a wet, useless slap and disappeared into the roving pile of the fallen. She fired again and again, but the monster did not stop. It did not even slow down. It lashed out with a tentacle that wrapped around her throat in a single fluid motion and snapped her neck with a crack. She fell to the ground and the tentacle pulled her into its depths until she was no longer visible. She hadn't been taken by the sun, not yet, but she was still lost. The rest of the survivors followed, their screams silenced one by one. The doctor felt the same overwhelming sense of hopelessness wash over him, the same shadow that had passed over him when he lost the last patient. What could he do? He was one physician against an overpowering force of destruction. Perhaps he could touch it and would fall dead like so many other organisms before. But what if it didn't? What if instead it wrapped around his body and squeezed the life from him? What if it carried him out into that cursed sunlight and he melted away like the others? He had to make a decision because the beast was advancing toward him. Doctor! Fernand shouted. It's going to destroy our facility! Indeed, the creature was flailing its appendages around, beating against the walls and trying to tear down steel and plaster, break down the shelter, until they too were exposed to the deadly light. I'm afraid this may be the end, my friend, the doctor lamented. I can see no hope for us now. No! Ferdinand shook his head. Let me save us. Let me lead it back outside. You'll be taken, the doctor cried. Perhaps not. I am a magnificent specimen, after all. I believe I can withstand the sun and return to continue our work together. Ferdinand scooped his sleeping Lord Blackwood from his shoulder and placed him gingerly on a nearby shelf. Thank you for your company. Then he turned back to the doctor. And thank you for my freedom and your friendship. It has been an honor. Before the doctor could protest, 
Ferdinand was running, his thunderous steps pounding the earth as he led the monster in a chase. It took the bait, following this new, large target back outside. He sealed off the tunnel behind them, ensuring the beast would not return the way it came. He wanted to believe Ferdinand's bravado, to think that the behemoth of a man had survived outside. But that night, he saw the great beast ooze past a window, and he could make out that familiar, wide, toothy grin protruding from its side. Just like that, the greatest assistant he had ever had was lost. Thank you for your service, my friend, he whispered to himself. I solemnly swear to you, your death shall not be in vain. Now go check out When Day Breaks, SCP-049, and When Day Breaks, SCP-096, for more terrifying tales from the world of When Day Breaks.